so I'm sorry that uh, Dr. Gu couldn't give the introduction herself. Um, she is working very hard on writing, and I do not envy her. <laughs> so uh, I will tell you about the lab, and if you have any follow-up questions, we can always pass them along to her. We research flaviviruses, which are a large group of viruses transmitted to humans by mosquitoes and ticks. Some examples of flaviviruses transmitted by mosquitoes include dengue, Zika, and West Nile virus. The map depicts where Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus mosquitoes live, with their main habitat in red, and areas where these vector species of mosquitoes don't live in blue. In some cases, infections by these viruses are mild, but in others, they can cause fever, internal bleeding, and problems in the nervous system, including the brain. You probably remember the Zika outbreak, which was in the news in 2015 and 2016, where we heard about widespread infection and a concerning correlation between Zika infection during pregnancy and babies being born with microencephaly or very small heads. Besides wanting to combat disease for its existing impact on human health, we also have indications that this family of viruses will become more widespread and common as people become more connected through global travel and our changing climate extends where the vector mosquitoes can live. When you get infected, your body produces an immune reaction in order to fight off the infection. Immune proteins called antibodies are a huge part of the normal immune response. When our bodies realize we have an infection that is making us sick, our immune system gets to work making these proteins that recognize and tag a part of the pathogen, such as dengue virus, which is red in this picture. Antibodies bind to viruses and prevent infection, and that way our cells, like the blob in purple on the right, can be protected from infection. Antibodies must be custom built for every type of virus your body encounters. After a dengue virus infection, the antibodies made by your immune system will block infection by the same virus. However, there are four types of dengue virus. And although in the vast majority of infections, antibodies provide protection from infection and disease, the antibody response to dengue virus is complicated as they can make dengue disease worse in some cases because you may not be protected from a different type of dengue virus. Why do antibodies for one type of dengue virus make infections by other types of dengue viruses worse? You may hear more about this on the tour with the work that Laura is doing to research antibody-dependent enhancement. Flaviviruses are very interesting to us because they are one of the uncommon cases where the antibody response, which we typically characterize as protective, can enhance infection with these specific viruses. While it's possible to observe this enhancement and see epidemiological trends on a population level, we want to understand the mechanisms behind when these antibodies have harmful effects and how we can use and or modify them to be protective. The next question is, can we design a vaccine that helps your body produce antibodies for all types of flaviviruses at once? Like you may have noticed on the earlier slide, there are four types of dengue virus which are distinctly recognized by our bodies. Currently, a vaccine does exist for dengue, but it was designed to have the body produce a different type of antibody for each type of dengue virus. Because of our understanding of virus-host interactions, we think it would be better to find an antibody which can recognize all four types of dengue. Since they are a related family of flaviviruses, there is evidence such an approach would be possible. We can use what scientists have learned about other viruses in order to inform our work. If you have more questions, Jay and I are working on this project. Finally, we'd like to understand how a virus may evolve in response to evolutionary pressure from antibodies. To address the third question, Jackson is working in our lab to study as many mutations in a virus as possible to identify the ways the virus can evolve to escape antibody response. To summarize the big picture, we research what causes antibody-mediated immunity and pathogenesis. This slide has a picture of Dr. Leslie Gu, who leads the lab. She has studied and become an expert in viruses and their interaction with the immune system and is putting the finishing touches on a grant today to fund our continued research.
As we gain more understanding of protective antibodies, we can even think about reverse engineering vaccines, which would be designed to elicit a protective rather than harmful antibody response. Besides preventative vaccines, better understanding these viruses and our body's response will also contribute to our ability to design medicines to treat people if they do become sick. Thank you so much for your attention today for the introduction of our lab tour, and we hope you enjoy seeing some of the work we do. We look forward to answering any questions that you have. Uh, my name is Jay Lubo. I'm a postdoctoral fellow. Um, that means that uh, I've completed my PhD and I'm working um, in uh, another investigator's lab. And um, so my day-to-day -day is uh, mostly working on experiments. So I have a couple projects that I, um, I get to work on. One of them um, is really my project that I, uh, I will be working on for months or maybe even years. And I have a fair amount of control over that and I get to decide what questions we're going to ask and how we're going to ask them. Um, and then I also contribute to other people's projects. So someone else in the lab has one that asks a slightly different question. They're more in charge of it, but when they need uh, extra hands or extra work, I help them and they help me. We work on a lot of, um, well, tissue culture, which are culturing of human cells um, that we then usually infect with viruses, and then a lot of bacterial culture. Um, and bacteria are really useful because we can use them to manipulate different genes. And so a lot of our, um, a lot of our sort of basic work about studying genes and uh, moving bits of DNA around happens in bacteria. And then I, I would say the more exciting parts of our work um, are in human cells where we do viral infections. We study a group of viruses called flaviviruses. And the most, the most well-known of them is dengue virus. Um, it infects uh, hundreds of millions of people per year and can cause some um, really nasty effects, fever and, and sometimes even death. Um, it's also very closely related to Zika virus and West Nile virus and are um, not quite as severe but can still be pretty dangerous. Is that what your study focuses on, the work you said is going to take months or years? Yeah, so that, that project is specifically trying to design a better vaccine against those viruses. Um, so we, uh, we study the bloods of, of people who have had the, the infection and whose immune systems are very good at fighting it off. And we try to learn why, why is their immune system so good at it and could we train other people's immune systems to be that good at it so that um, people wouldn't get infected anymore. I think I've known for, for quite a while, I was really lucky that in high school I had a class that um, taught microbiology and molecular genetics. And so I, um, I got to do all kinds of cool experiments in bacteria and with genes that glow and cutting up DNA. And, and I just thought that was really super fun. And uh, so then when I went to college, I chose a major that um, had those words in the title and I figured, well, I'll see if I like this. And it turns out I really liked it a lot. And so, um, yeah, I, uh, I finished my degree in that. I worked in a lab while I was in college and um, had a really good experience there. And I just kept finding new labs and, and moving forward. I went to graduate school at the University of Michigan. Um, and there I studied HIV. Um, and specifically, we looked at uh, ways in which human cells have defenses against HIV. And um, unfortunately, those defenses aren't perfect. Uh, HIV has ways around them. And so we study a pretty complex interaction where the body has a defense against the virus. The virus has a counter defense that neutralizes that defense and uh, manages to cause infection. Um, and then uh, I finished that up earlier this year. And um, then I came here to the Hutch. I spend a lot of time with my dog. I have a five-year-old lab pit mix. Uh, he's a lot of fun. What's the name of your dog? His name is Miko. So after we've lysed the bacteria, all the contents of the bacterial cell comes out and the genomic DNA likes to stick to itself. We can add a buffer that will cause it to form clumps in the solution. Um, and then we centrifuge it, so we spin it really fast, and all of that clumpy stuff sticks together and sinks to the bottom of the tube. And the plasmid DNA is too small to do that, so it stays in the liquid, um, and then we apply that liquid to this column. I'll check, make sure that there's a pellet at the bottom, and that this worked. Looks like these all worked really well. Okay, so now I have all these pellets of bacteria that hopefully contain the genes that I'm interested in. Um, and the next step is we want to make a new solution. 
um, where we resuspend, which means we pipette up and down to uh, get this bacterial pellet on the bottom of the tube. We want to mix all of those cells up into this pink liquid. There we go. So now you see the pink liquid is a little bit cloudy. That means all of our cells are there. Anyway, and now I'm going to do that with all 24 of these. Oh, this is one of my favorite crazy contraptions. Um, it is called a Kayavac. So it creates a vacuum in this blue tube down here. So later we're going to have a bunch of steps where we add liquid to these columns. We want the liquid to flow through. When you do that, you have two options. You can centrifuge it. So you spin it and force all the liquid through. That's kind of a pain because you have to add it to the centrifuge and then you have to remove it and you have to add your new liquid. This is really neat because we'll add the liquid to all of these at the same time, turn on the vacuum, it'll suck all of the liquid through, and then we turn off the vacuum, and then we can do our next step. And we just repeat that over and over again, and it, um, it allows us to do a lot, of, a lot of washing of these things really quickly. All right, so we're getting near the end of our DNA isolation. So now we have lots of plasma DNA here in this yellow solution. It hopefully has the gene that we're interested in. So I add it one by one to these columns. And then in a few seconds, we're going to use a vacuum to suck all this liquid through all at once. And as it gets sucked through, the DNA that's present in the yellow liquid is going to stick to these little white columns at the base here. Then we'll wash it a few times, and then we'll release it. All right, so this is hooked up to a, a building-wide vacuum system, and we should suck all that liquid through all at once. Well, that was easy. Wasn't that easy? All right, and then we're going to wash it. This wash buffer, which is basically just water and ethanol. And if there's any sort of contaminants like protein um, that is stuck in here with our DNA, this wash buffer should get rid of it. We've been trying to grow up these genes a few times, and um, they have not been working. Some, some DNA sequences are more fragile than others. And uh, these are all pretty fragile. So since we've had difficulty in the past, we decided, well, let's just grow up a whole bunch of them and we'll use whatever works. And since we're doing so many, today is going to be a pretty repetitive day. But fortunately, most of my days aren't like this. But every day is a different adventure. I suppose it would be uh, not to be afraid of, uh, of being really passionately nerdy about things. Like if there's something that excites you, um, whether that's art or science or history or whatever, whatever it is that interests you, um, throw yourself into it uh, as hard as you can and um, see if that's uh, what you want to make a career out of. Um, some people are lucky and the first thing they throw themselves into um, it makes them really happy, and um, they can be passionate about it and build a career out of it. Other people try a few of them before they decide what really works for them. Um, but the sooner that you commit and really throw yourself into something, the sooner you'll know whether or not it's the right fit for you. So my name is Laura Belmont. I am a graduate student uh, here in the Goo Lab, and my day-to-day -day is a lot of planning, running, analyzing experiments, uh, reading papers, writing fellow like training fellowships and grants, general meetings, thinking about science, sort of stuff like that. So how my program is set up is there are kind of rotations during your first year of your PhD. So for us, we got 10 weeks in three different labs where we got to kind of see what the lab environment was like, what the science was like, how we got along with the PI, the person in charge with the lab, and other lab members. And then at the end of doing all of our rotations, we chose one lab 
to stay in for the rest of the time. Um, and so you make that choice at the end of your first year. And since our year ends in uh, basically June, I've been in this lab since June. So I did my undergraduate studies at Arizona State University and I double majored. My first degree was biological sciences with a concentration in genetic cell and developmental biology. And then my second degree was a biochemistry degree. As for wanting to do graduate school, that kind of arose because I started doing research very young compared to when most people do. I actually started doing research when I was in high school and I really, really enjoyed it. And I really wanted to kind of continue down that path. And even as an undergrad, I still was really enjoying it and really was interested in, you know, doing research full time and eventually getting to the point where I could mentor others and bring up that next generation in science. I started doing CrossFit at the beginning of last year um, and have really, really enjoyed that. I, I think in general, I like bigger dogs. I personally would really like to steal my parents' dog and we don't know what she is, but we think that she's a mix between a lab and a boxer and she's very spunky. Um, I am very much drawn to dogs that have a lot of chaotic, spunky energy to them. Um, if, that dog, if that dog is not a troublemaker, I don't get along with it as well for some reason. So the reason we have an open flame is because when you're working with bacteria, it's very easy for contaminants to get in. And this is supposed to make it so it's harder for those contaminating bacteria that you don't want to get into your sample. We have just pulled all of our tubes of our bacteria with the DNA out of the incubator. And now they will be put onto a plate and go overnight. So we are taking the bacteria from the tube and adding a small amount to the plate. We want a smaller amount on the plate because we want to be able to pick an individual colony. A colony is a cluster of bacterial cells and we want to make sure that we're only choosing one cluster of cells because if we take a, a set of cells that have more, um, there's a higher chance that mutations might have occurred and we want our specific DNA sequence that we put in the cells to be what we get out. Um, so I added the little dot of the bacterial liquid to the plate and now I'm just kind of streaking around, try to get a nice even spread all across the plate. And then I'm placing it upside down um, so they're growing on the top. Why do you do that? Uh, if you don't have it growing on the top, you have a higher chance of getting um, sort of liquid collecting um, on the lid that would then drip down and potentially contaminate your plate. I would actually say that it's probably skewed more towards like brain stuff, like reading, writing, and planning, and thinking, and analyzing. Um, maybe like two thirds of your time is brain stuff, and one third of your time is hand stuff. Okay, so now all of our plates are streaked, and we will set them to incubate overnight. First, I'll be wrapping them in some paper towels to make sure that they don't dry out, but then they'll go off to the incubator. So if you are someone who's interested in pursuing science, I would say to go for it and not really consider things off the table. I know that I originally had no idea that I could do research when I was in high school. And the only reason that I learned that it was an option is because I had a conversation with a friend who ended up doing a summer, like a summer high school research experience. And um, she was telling me about it and I kind of, I was kind of like a, a mind blown situation where I had no idea that that was even an option. And from there decided to just like email some professors at my local university and see if there's any way I could get involved. And 
you're going to get some no's. Um, some of it may even just be because you're too young to be in the lab. Some labs have rules about age restrictions. Um, some people might not reply to you, but in the end, like eventually you will get an answer or you will get connected with an opportunity. So don't be afraid to go for those opportunities because they are out there, even if you don't necessarily know about it right now. I think that there is a lot of pressure when you're in high school, in college, you know, and kind of generally when you're younger and starting to get closer to whatever your next step is um, to kind of do everything and be this perfect person and, and, you know, get the best grades you can, get these great test scores, do all of these different extracurriculars. And it's great to, you know, challenge yourself and be involved in your community, but also remember that like you are a person who matters and it's important to take care of yourself and to take time for yourself. If you are feeling really stressed or experiencing other things that are kind of impacting your life, it is okay to reach out for help. It is okay to step back from things. Nobody is expecting you to be perfect. And even if you're the person that's expecting you to be perfect, it's okay to occasionally let, let that ball down. Um, and it's okay that it's okay to know that you matter. Uh, my name is Jackson Barr Stewart. I'm a second year in the interdisciplinary pathobiology program here at UW. Um, I currently work in Dr. <laughs> Leslie Gu's lab and on the day to day, I'm working on my thesis project. I, my project is looking at antibodies that are produced in response to infections from viruses such as Zika virus or Dengue virus. Um, and we're interested in antibody responses to these viruses because there's a phenomenon with these viruses where your immune response to the first infection can actually cause a worse infection the second time around. And we don't really understand the dynamics of that. Why, why are some antibodies protective? Why are some antibodies harmful in a sense? Uh, this is a very low percentage of cases, but it does exist. And so my project tries to answer why certain antibodies create that issue. So it's, it's most well known with dengue virus. Um, Zika virus is a very closely related flavivirus. So we are starting to see some evidence that this can happen with Zika as well. Um, and the concern is that the interplay of dengue and Zika in the same regions can cause issues um, that we're not, we're not fully aware of yet because they haven't existed together for very long. Uh, there are other viruses, actually a coronavirus in cats does show the same phenomenon, but I believe dengue and then this cat coronavirus are the only two confirmed viruses to have this sort of secondary infection. I actually started off as a kind of history nerd. I was, I entered undergrad as a history major, um, and a part of history that I actually just kind of naturally gravitated to was pandemics. So the Justinian plague or the Black Death or all the various you know, introduction of smallpox. I always found those to be morbidly fascinating. Um, so there was some classes in my undergrad that kind of took a hybrid look at disease through like a societal viewpoint. And I think that was a good segue from looking at disease as a historical context to looking at disease as a biological phenomenon. Um, and then from there, I switched over to a major called Global Disease Biology. Um, and part of that major, I joined an undergraduate lab to get my feet wet with lab research, and I just found out that I really enjoyed it. And even though it's very frustrating, it can be rewarding. <laughs> Graduated from my undergrad, and then I spent a year just working full time as a lab tech. And then during that time, I also applied to graduate programs. And now I'm here and in my second year. I went to high school at Canyon Crest Academy in uh, San Diego, California. And then I went to college at University of California, Davis, up near Sacramento area. Weirdly enough, uh, the, I went on a cruise when I was young with my family from Seattle to Alaska. And I remember even like being young thinking like Seattle's awesome. Um, it's gloomy as heck <laughs> and just thought I would like to live there. And then a few years ago, my dad retired and decided to move to an area near Seattle. Uh, so that in combination with just UW having great programs and great research. It's a pretty easy decision. Um, I do a lot of, well, in the summer, I do a lot of backpacking with my partner and my dog. 
We like to go out to the Cascades and spend a couple nights out there. What's your, where's your uh, favorite place to hike or camp? Uh, there's a place called Cutthroat Pass in North Cascades, which is on the Pacific Crest Trail. It is extremely metal. <laughs> it's some parts of it you're walking along and there's just a sheer edge right on the other side. But if you can kind of steady yourself, it's a really awesome trail and a lot of fun and beautiful. Today we're going to be taking a look at my Vero cells. The Vero is just the name of the cell. And they, this is a continuous cell line, so it's been designed to just grow forever, essentially. Um, I don't want to use the word cancerous cell line, A, because that makes it sound scary, but B, they're actually designed to not introduce mutations that would then result in a cancerous cell line. So they grow forever, but they don't actually accumulate deleterious mutations. Um, and I'm going to go over here and pull them out of our incubator. Real quick. And so I actually just thawed these from our liquid nitrogen. And the reason they're in this kind of tiny flask here is because when you first thaw cells, you want them to actually be fairly crowded together so that they can actually talk to each other and say, hey, this is where we're going to grow. We're going to be happy. If they're too far apart, it's kind of like, hey, where's, where are all my friends? <laughs> and then the cells don't work very well. So I'm just going to look in here and double check to make sure that things are looking OK. And you can see a bunch of cells in here. And that looks good. All right. On the screen here, we have what are called chromatograms. They are essentially just colored peaks that tell me exactly what nucleotide exists at a certain position. And how I use this is for my research, I need to create a lot of different mutant viruses that differ from each other by just a few mutations here or there. And so in order to verify that my virus is indeed a mutant form and that I can go ahead with experiments on it, I need to sequence the virus to make sure that it is exactly what we think it is. And so sequencing, we basically just go through and read the genome. We just go at this position. So, you know, right here, this blue peak corresponds to a cytosine or a C nucleotide. So the sequence on this specific virus here is going to be A, C, C, A. Um, and you can see that that differs from this line down here. It goes A, C, G, G instead of A, C, C, A. So these two uh, mutations, and again, these rows correspond to different viruses that I have, will actually result in a different protein being um, produced at this position. Uh, which I can then use to investigate differences between strains. For this specific project, which is just kind of a kind of side project to my larger thesis, uh, we're looking at the effect of individual mutations on antibody neutralization. Um, and so when an antibody binds to a virus and then hopefully neutralizes it, it binds to a very specific part of the virus and that specific part of the virus is controlled by the virus's genetic code. Uh, so I can go in and make these little changes of kind of force a mutation and then ask how does this new mutation affect my antibody's ability to neutralize the new uh, virus. Uh, and the, the reason I'm doing this is we found a mutation that looks like it actually increases the ability of certain antibodies to neutralize uh, Zika virus. And so I'm just investigating that further by creating mutations that essentially reproduce that data. But again, dengue and Zika are very closely related, particularly when you're looking at this region of the virus. Uh, so the data still needs to be shown, which I'm working on. But hopefully, these mutations that we identify in Zika will be translatable to dengue as well. Um, that one's hard, because you get thrown a lot of like cliches as a high schooler, right? Um, but I, I think one that was definitely told to me as a high schooler, and it di I didn't internalize it, but I, I wish I had because it does it is true, is that there's not, there's not a path. There's not a right path to take. There's no quest you set out on that's going to get you exactly where you want to go, and it's like a clear path. There's a lot of twists and turns. Um, and just being open to changing where you want to go or just pursuing whatever happens to interest you in the moment is totally fine. And, it may lead to careers or it may lead to nothing, and that, that's also fine. Uh, I spent a lot of time stressing about where I was going. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lisa. I use she, her, her pronouns, and I work as a research tech and a lab manager for the Goo Lab. 
um, on a day-to-day -day basis that it involves like a whole variety of things. So sometimes I'm doing experiments for answering questions that I'm doing on my own projects. A lot of times I'm helping my coworkers with any experiments they have on their projects. Uh, I also make sure we have all the things that we need, so reagents and supplies to do our experiments. And then sometimes I get to attend seminars or meetings and think about scientific questions. So I really love the variety. When I was in high school, actually, I think this is relevant for high schoolers. I did uh, the equivalent of a running start program, um, but this was in Minnesota. And then I went to my undergrad um, with some of those credits and like things that I was studying. Straight out of graduating from my bachelor's degree, I decided to apply to jobs in outside of my home state because I was afraid I would never see anywhere else. And that's kind of how I ended up here. So I worked in another lab testing HIV vaccines. Um, so on people who donated uh, their blood after like volunteering to uh, help scientists understand if the vaccine would work. Um, and then I saw that the Goo Lab was coming to Fred Hutch and I was really excited to come and work here. I was always a very curious kid, um, but I don't think I ever thought I was going to become a scientist. Like I never was like dreaming that I would wake up and be doing this or anything. Um, when I was taking some of those running start classes, I had this really cool professor who just like animated and spoke about everything that she was doing um, to such a way that was really inspiring. Like I was learning about the immune system and I sat there and thought, oh my gosh, this is happening in my own body and like I can't believe that. I don't have to think about remembering to breathe or like remembering for my heart to pump. And it does that, and I just thought it was really beautiful that um, that exists and that I could learn more about it and appreciate it. Um, and I also found it really compelling to think that I could help people with um, the work that I do. So after taking classes with her, I knew when I went to college that I wanted to study biology. And so I did that and tried my best to get internships, and those helped me, I think, land jobs here later on so I think a lot of times like what you're working on in science matters but what matters more is the people that you're with in whatever job you do and that's been a really wonderful lesson to like find a group that you get along with really well and find mentors who are interested in your advancement and care about you it doesn't have to be the only thing they do but it is something that is really important for helping you, I think, and it makes you feel really valued and welcome. Since we have been home a lot more, my partner and I have adopted a puppy, so I spend a lot of time <laughs> training the puppy and walking him. I guess he's like over a year old now. What's the name of your dog? Oh, his name is Buddy. He is a mix, so at first everyone thought he was a Taiwanese mountain dog, um, but when we did the DNA testing, we found that he's like a mix of a chihuahua and a German Shepherd and like a poodle and a Belgian Mangalese and yeah, just like a huge variety. He's 5.8% super mutt according to the company. So he's very adorable and very smart. Only a scientist would have their dog DNA tested to see what kind of <laughs> Yeah, I was like, I would never DNA test myself, but for the dog, I'm like, he can't have health insurance that will discriminate against him. <laughs> I've also been taking math classes outside of work, and that's because I am hoping to eventually study biostatistics, and I didn't take a bunch of math classes as an undergrad, and I think, actually, I kind of thought, you know, that math wasn't my thing, and that I guess, maybe not that I couldn't do it, but I didn't enjoy it, and I would not ever, or like, I wasn't cut out for it, um, but in my last job, we were doing like these really complex assays, and it was really, there were so many details and there was a lot to learn. It was very complicated. And I realized that I had learned it over time and like put a lot of effort into it. And I thought like, oh, if I can do this compl complicated thing, then I think I should try again on math. I have some cells that I wanted to measure um, the surface markers on them. So I stained them with fluorescently labeled antibodies. And antibodies, as we've probably talked about before, are specific to something like very particular, a molecule. And so they can help us like bind tightly and see if something's there. 
And then the antibodies are conjugated or bound to uh, fluorescent molecules. When I'm staining for flow cytometry, I'll often make like a mix of a staining antibody, which looks, I can dig it out of here. It looks like this, it's a little vial, um, and it says what it is. So APC is the dye, and then it's made in a mouse, and it's against human CD64, which is one of the FC gamma receptors on a cell. So I'm trying to stain for that. So what I would do is mix this with a buffer, maybe like PBS, and add that to my cells. So after I have that antibody, or like sometimes I'll stain with many of them at once, um, I'll let them sit in the dark. Sometimes people will put the cells in the fridge. Um, it, it doesn't always matter. It depends on how much extra staining you want to get. And then I'll go ahead whoops, and add a little bit of liquid to dilute the stain. And then I would go ahead and wash. So. What I'll do is add it, oops, you want to make sure that the liquid is drawn up evenly, like I was trying to get rid of the bubbles, and then as long as I don't touch the wells, I'm not so worried about squirting this wash right into the wells, is you'll actually see the cells in the bottom of these wells. Right now you can't see anything but when I like spin them down they'll get all smushed into the bottom and that way when I'm done spinning I'll go ahead and take the plate and actually flick it upside down and get rid of all of the extra buffer and there should be just cells so I can continue working with them sometimes when you first try it you're afraid you're gonna lose your whole experiment <laughs> When we're working with dengue, we actually need to, or like any infectious virus, we'll take these centrifuge buckets out and put them in the BSC so that there's not really, you're minimizing the chance of aerosolizing any virus that you're working with. So like if I took this in the BSC, I'd, I'd be working in there and put my plate in like this, close it and add the top. In that way, you know, we feel more protected um, against infectious agents. But like I said, these are just cell lines and they're not infectious. So I'm not very worried about that today. So now the centrifuge is almost done um, and we'll see if we have some nice cell pellets. Sometimes if you're not using a lot of cells, you don't see the pellet and it can make you worried that you're actually doing all this work and you won't be able to measure any cells. Um, but hopefully today I put a lot of cells in the plate, so <laughs> we should see something. Oh yeah, you can see them. So can you see that fuzzy? Yeah. So it's in these wells yeah. and those two. So then what we're going to do is we'll actually go down to the flow cytometry core, which is in the basement of this building. And um, we'll actually, for these, since they're in the plate, I can use a robotic arm. And that will actually suck up the liquid that the cells are suspended in. And the cells will go through this instrument which measures the fluorescence of the different antibodies that are stained on it basically and so we can actually look at many different cell surface proteins and intracellular proteins with flow cytometry staining and it's a huge tool in immunology um, yeah so it's really interesting because like the cells are going in one stream and there's like a laser that's shooting at them or sometimes actually like up to five lasers um, and then as the cell is going by, the laser excites the fluorophore and it will be measured on a detector. Um, and actually with the different lasers, there's a way to set up the timing. So like when the cell goes by the red laser and then it goes by the green and then it goes by blue, you know, and then you can kind of measure from that at different wavelengths.
So it's a very intro to flow cytometry. <laughs> I've been really interested in working with Touch United, which is our employee resource group on campus. Um, interested in, like, I guess, being by scientists and for scientists for increasing diversity, equity, inclusion in science. Um, there are multiple groups on campus, but this one's been pretty cool, and I've been working on educational outreach. So there's a Black Lives Matter Digest, which is really cool since. Um, you know, people have been wanting to learn about what can we like read or learn or support. And so, so we also have FREE, which is Fred Hutch Rainbow Employees for Equity, um, which is the LGBTQ plus group. A piece of advice that I also have, um, recognizing that a lot of people might feel like they don't really have a network. You feel like maybe you don't really know anybody in a field that you want to do. And one thing I did when I felt like I didn't really know anybody uh, was I just called them <laughs> if I thought somebody was doing a really cool job. Um, the first way that I got an internship that I was excited about was I just found their phone number on the internet and called and said like, can I work for you and be an intern? And like, the first person I called actually, they said no. They don't like have a space or time because one misconception is that being an intern is just beneficial. It's actually like a lot of work <laughs> to take care of an intern and make sure they have a good, productive experience. But what I did when they said no is I said, okay, well, maybe, is there anyone else that you know that I could talk to? And so I called the next person that this one told me about and they said no too. So then I said, okay, well, do you know anyone else I can talk to? And so then they sent me down the line and finally I actually got to somebody who was open to having an intern and it was a really good experience. So. I guess even if you feel like you don't know anybody, it is possible. I don't, maybe it's not as easy, but like, yeah, I think it's worth giving it a shot. A pro tip is everybody loves talking about their science, like including me. <laughs> so if you reach out to somebody and ask them about what they do, like genuinely caring about what they say, a lot of times you can really form a connection in a way that I guess both parties feel pretty good about. So I'd recommend it.